Mirrors by Green Searcher. Chapter 25, Part 2. I have to get out of here. Sussy barreled through the dark halls. Her body began to appear again. Having barely managed to stay invisible long enough to escape her old master's attack and the commander's blade, she wound down a set of stairs, body screaming, feet large and awkward beneath her. She reached out onto the railing to catch her balance. Long black nails gripped the fine wood. She gasped at the sight, pulling away and stumbling down the remaining stairs. Panting, she took a long minute to catch her breath before she slowly raised her hands to her eyes, staring at the clawed fingers. Then, trembling, she raised them to her face. Feeling the way her canines jutted from her upper lip, the strange softness of hair covering neck and shoulders, you really are a monster. She cried out, burying her claws in her scalp, a flash of pain, and something pushed its way from her skull, rough against her fingers. Horns, long and sharp. Her scream rang in the air, and a new sound echoed back, cracking, rumbling, and after a heartbeat, the ground began to quake. Cersei's neck snapped up, watching as a large marble column shook with rage, a large crack dashing up the nearest one, several fragments of balconies above slamming down onto the ground all around her. Gasping, she stood and ran mindlessly to the nearest doors. They opened into a grand space. The ballroom. A glittering chandelier at its centre and tall mirrors lining the round dance floor. She ran to the closest mirror, slapping her hands against its surface. Take me away! She shouted. Nothing happened. Give me escape! She cried, frantic. New cracks sped along the ground beneath her feet and the chandelier shook, its ornaments clanking wildly. The floor quaked again and it came down with a violent crash. Glass flew in all directions, bits slicing through her skin. Cersei barely covered her eyes in time to avoid a second blindness. She looked up then, watching the room crumble around her. Her heart felt heavy and slow, too slow for how frightened she felt. Turning to the windows, she sprinted towards them, barreling through the glass, falling into the darkness below. Something caught her, a bush, thick but rough, scratching up her skin even further. She tumbled out, falling to onto her hands and knees, taking in her surroundings in the early twilight. Rows of bright flowers, overgrown from neglect, but unmistakable. The King's Gardens, the place where it all began. She shrieked, racing past the tall greenery, hands pressed against her temples. Her feet found their own way, for as much as she hated this place, she still remembered the patterns and turns from long ago. The stables and the gates just ahead. She ran towards them. A carriage, she thought. I could take a carriage. A horse. Walk away from here if I have to. Firelight in the trees. Men. Hundreds of them. Storming the castle. She paused, taking in the sight. That will do. Crouching in the darkness, she waited. As Firelight came closer, she snatched the first unlucky fellow to pass her way. A flash of light. He pushed her off him, shouting, calling for his friends. She retreated into the shadows, shaking, sweating. Confused. Were they protected from her too? Gasping, she escaped back into the gardens, winding her way towards the back gates, away from the angry men. Beyond the tall walls, finally, hidden among the trees. Safe. Not safe. The voices and firelight followed. She swore, breaking into an impossible run. Deep into the woods, Nothing looked familiar here. Her limbs grew heavy the longer she ran, the trees all around growing shorter and shorter. Soon the ache in her back was too much and her hands hit the earth below. Not hands. Pause. She stopped staring at them in horror. No, she said, or tried to say, but her voice was no longer her own no longer human. She cried out at the realisation, the rasping sounds frightening a group of crows from the nearby tree. They scattered above the canopy, disappearing against the dim horizon. Her own shoulders neared the treetops now, 
body stretching against her skin and strange ropes of hair falling from her neck and shoulders. She cried out again, a roar in the cold wind, taking off in a new sprint. The woods grew darker, yet smaller the larger she grew. Yet she only felt more frightened at the sight of them, pines prickling her sides. It was growing cold, the last rays of sun barely glinting over the hilltops. No longer able to ignore her fatigue, she stopped where she was, a flat plateau among the hills. Where was she? Papa! Papa, where are you? Cersei started, scanning the large clearing. It was difficult to make anything out, for the world had grown tinted with red and horribly dark. But then she saw it. A child, alone among the thin trees. She rubbed a small hand over her eyes, pulling them away to reveal tear-stained cheeks. Papa, please! I'll, I'll be better, I promise! She called out. Cersei moved closer, and the child turned towards the noise, eyes round and blind and frightened. Hello? She asked. Cersei only stared at the child, silent. Please, help me, the girl whimpered. I'm lost. So am I, the girl grimaced, turning away. She reached into her skirts, pulling out a small scarlet rose. Crushing it in her palms, she threw it to the ground in a rage. She fell to her knees, to her side, curling in on herself as she wept. The earth around her began to glow, a circle of light surrounding the girl's small body, and from it, a small dome of roses grew up and around her. Circe approached, reaching towards the vision. But the moment she touched them, the roses and the young occupant vanished before her eyes. Circe stared at the spot, numb, then pressed her own clawed fingers to the earth. A new rose burst forth from the soil, then another, the plant winding around her in a glowing circle and growing slowly overhead. Once a child, then an enchantress, and now a monster. She laid her down beneath the living dome and let the darkness consume her. The ground came hard. Adam felt the impact radiate from his heels to his skull, and he fell to his knees, throwing out one hand and using the other to pull Belle's head against his chest. He gruntled, muscles trembling and heart pounding from the thrill of his jump. Adam! He let Bell slip from his arms, taking a moment to catch his breath and assess the damage. Rolling over, he carefully tested his legs one at a time. They ached and the bottom of his feet screamed in pain. But everything still moved at his command. It's all right, he managed, grinning finally. My bones are unbreakable, remember? Bell stared at him incredulous. I believe Agatha said nearly unbreakable, she pointed out. She looked back up towards the balcony, three stories from where the others continued to fight. You really just... She stopped then, and her eyes grew wide. Adam followed her gaze and gasped. The hall of arms had vanished. Instead, the walls that once housed empty suits of armour were now the faces of several dozen buildings, each several stories tall, with windows crooked and cracked. A street spread beneath their feet, and cobblestones missing in several places, and filled with dark puddles. Clothes lines spread across the alley above them, stained tunics pinned up in several places and left out to dry. And then people, hundreds of them, all ages and statuses, hurrying through the narrow street. A group of children ran past, and Adam reached out. Yet at their contact, their forms merely shifted, his fingers sweeping right through them. Ghosts, he breathed out nervously, pulling his hand back to his chest. Or an illusion, Bell noted, now standing beside him. He nodded, slowly, looking back at the forms all around him. But why would Cersei? Leave her for a rose, monsieur? He looked down. A young girl stood there, blonde hair matted against her neck. She held a small, worn basket in the crook of her arm, filled with a dozen bright red roses. You can see us? Belle asked her. She reached out a gentle hand, 
but her fingertips vanished against the girl's shoulder. No, the girl replied, but I heard you. It was then Adam noticed the fog that filled her eyes. That, and the strange familiarity of her face. He frowned, uncomfortable, though uncertain why. Where are we? He asked her. The Paris of my childhood, she replied simply. The one we knew, once. You're looking for us, aren't you? Us? Come, I'll show you the way, she said. She turned, weaving her way blindly through the thick crowds. Adam watched her go, then looked down at Belle. Her face had grown pale, eyes wide as she bet his eyes. It's her. I remember. From the visions. Agatha showed us, she said hollowly. That's Circe. Adam's skin grew cold, realising why she seemed so familiar. He stared back towards the spot where the girl had vanished. A trick? He wondered. I don't know. They stood in silence for a moment, watching the mirage of people hurry past them, through them. She can't hurt us, Adam said at last, repeating Belle's own words. And I don't know what it is, but I feel like we should follow her. Me too. Me too. And so they moved quickly through the crowds in search of the young girl. No one else paid them any mind, the forms dissolving into mist at their touch. There, Belle said, pointing towards a fleeting form as it ducked into an alleyway. They ran towards it, rounding the corner and entering the narrow street. But it wasn't a narrow street. Instead, a wide expanse opened before them. Filled with greens and violets and reds that smiled beneath the midday sun. A fountain bubbled at the centre, stone angels pouring buckets of water into its shimmering pool. Adam looked back, but the Parisian street was gone. Instead, several neatly trimmed paths radiated out from the main circular courtyard where they stood. My father's gardens, he realised. Someone crossed the path up ahead, disappearing again beneath tall bushes. Adam and Belle hurried to follow, rounding a bend and catching sight of the young Circe just ahead. Her basket was gone, framed smaller than before. She had stopped at the end of the row, leaning close to one of the bushes and closing her eyes. Then she reached out, plucking a young flower from the plant's base and bringing it towards the tip of her nose. Inhaling deeply, she smiled to herself. It smells so nice, she whispered as they approached. Then, turning back, she looked just past Adam's shoulder, with those clouded eyes. Don't you think so? Adam only stared at her. His skin had grown cold again, heart racing in a confusion and a strange kind of fear. Young Circe offered him the rose then, but he shook his head slowly, backing away. The girl didn't seem perturbed, however, simply tucking the flower into her apron and dashing off once again. Adam? He was barely aware that Belle had moved in front of him. In fact, she stood with one arm out, as though defending him against the child. The image might have been comical, if he didn't feel so sick inside. Maybe this was a bad idea, Belle said, shooting one last glance towards the girl's retreating form, before turning back and resting a hand on his arm. Maybe we should just... No, he said roughly, gritting his teeth. Let's keep going. The plants grew taller as they moved through the gardens. Too tall, towering over them like a forest. No, this was a forest now, wasn't it? Adam looked back again, the pines sweeping into a deep valley below before climbing the hills painting the horizon. His own woods, it seemed though they had ventured much further into its depths than he had ever gone before. They were led up a steep cliff, following the child's fleeting form as she wove between the trees, rain hammering against the canopy overhead, dripping through in heavy droplets at their feet. Adam had to push through the lush vegetation, no path beneath their feet to guide them. Are you all right? he asked, turning back to Belle. She nodded from behind them, flush but not yet winded. He sucked in a heavy breath at his own exertion, looking back where the child had led them. Some kind of trail had finally emerged from the grove there, just barely visible in the twilight. Jagged and winding, leaving trees uprooted and scattered across the earth in its wake. 
and in those not felled, claw marks, deep and long, leaving the bark black and rotted. Claw marks that were definitely not his. Adam looked at Belle again. Keep going. He asked quietly. She reached for his hand and nodded. As they followed the broken path up the mountainside, a strange hilltop began to slowly jut from the skyline. No trees grew on it, the surface almost completely round where it emerged from the forest. Adam thought it looked like something of a dome atop a cathedral. Or a tomb. Yet, as they approached, he quickly realised his mistake. This was no hilltop, but a giant thorny bush winding around the cliffs and tangling itself in the treetops above. Its roses were dark in colour, nearly black, and a disconcerting crunching sound permeated the air as the vines continued to twist themselves around their branches. Circe's young, ghost-like form paused as they reached the thick wall of flowers. Then, with a body like smoke, she moved inside. They followed, stopping at the edge of the dark plant. Adam strained his eyes but could see nothing on the other side to tell him how thick or how deep this living fortress went. So naturally, he slid his sword from his belt and hacked through the nearest section without another thought. Adam, wait! Belle's warning came too late, for the vines, it seemed, did not take too kindly to his attempts. Instead of retreating, they wound themselves quickly around the blade and threatened to pull it from his grip. Adam cussed, kicking up one boot against the closest stalk for leverage, and he tugged back with all his might. After a good deal of effort, he finally managed to loose the weapon and fell back flat on his derriere. Belle made a soft sound of amusement. You forgot, she said, helping him up. Adam brushed the dirt from the back of his trousers as he watched her reach out, small fingers sweeping over the angry plants. Their movement ceased and the vines shriveled, fading away into a black mist. Adam blushed. Oh, yeah. He tucked the sword back into place and stood beside her. Then, reaching forward, as she had done, he brushed against the dark flowers with a long sweep of his arm. The plants fell away as expected, and the beginnings of a dark path opened before them. They moved in slowly, touching the roses periodically to remove a fresh patch from their trail. The ground was soft beneath their feet, wet from the rain, though it could no longer reach them through the thick plants. All seemed still and silent as they moved deeper inside the mound of roses. That was until a crunching sound rang in their ears once again. Belle gasped and Adam looked back. Vines slithered towards them from along the forest floor and from the growth above, moving like long, hungry snakes. The path they had taken was already gone, filled in with new thorns and flowers that took place of the old. Adam threw his hands out again, as did Belle but they couldn't stop it all as the deadly bush grew in around them from all sides. An enormous thorn jutted between them, sinking deep into the soft earth. What do we do? Belle cried, her voice barely audible above the violent rustling all around them. Adam tried to think, heart hammering in fresh fear, and making it impossible to do so. He swatted at the plants, but the small patches he managed to kill off were quickly replaced with new growth. Why wasn't it stopping? Acting on impulse, he squatted quickly, pulling Belle down between his thighs and curling his arms around her as tightly as they could. The needled vines wove around them in an instant. Slowly, the thorns poked through their clothes and between loose strands of their hair. Adam had already forfeited his shirt to Giles' blood bleeding gut, so only a cloak borrowed from one of their men now stood between the needles and his exposed skin. It can't hurt us, he thought desperately, squeezing his eyes shut. It can't! And it didn't. The violent rustling stopped, and Adam opened his eyes. The vines had finally stilled, wound all around them, thorns having torn holes through cloth and leather, and ripped the ribbons from her hair. Yet, no place did they touch skin. They exhaled as one, though Adam could feel his own heart beating through Belle. Just because they weren't hurt didn't take away from the unnerving feeling of being buried alive inside a dark nest of breathing foliage. I guess we just keep going, he observed, swallowing. Belle nodded against him. 
Slowly, they stood, and the plants receded, just enough for them to stand, holding each other tight. They remained that way, moving slowly as one body through the dense growth, unwilling to let its dark tendrils come between them. The final rays of twilight soon vanished, and what little light they had disappeared. They pushed on, unsure where or when they would find the end to this web of darkness. And then they heard something new. A rumble of a voice, unintelligible yet desperate. The growth grew patchy then, and moonlight pointed to freedom. They pushed through, and the roses finally parted into a clearing. It opened into a wide dome, roses crawling along its ceiling, a few tendrils hanging down to drape against the earth, and the enormous breathing form that lay there. Its back jutted in a high arch, greyish-white fur tangling with the vines above. What seemed to be rainwater wove through its fur like long trails of tears, dripping from its jowls and pooling into the soft earth. Yet, from the silence above, it seemed the rain had already stopped. The creature took a breath, long and rattling, before reaching a hand out towards the small body of water. Void revelation to escape. It mumbled, its voice like death. Escape. Staring at the form with wide eyes, Belle and Adam took a few steps closer. And, finally, the creature raised its head. The earth around trembled at the movement, large sections of the dome of growth falling to the ground. The grass beneath their feet shifted. Belle made a squeal of surprise, planting a hand to her mouth and backing into Adam. He pulled her close even as all the hair that remained on his back flew up on end. For what had seemed like a fallen tree trunk at first glance, turned out to be a tail, long and naked, disappearing into the fresh pool of water and emerging on the other side. It flicked up high in the air, before curling itself against the giant creature's body. It rose up on its haunches, strange locks of matted fur emerging from the water, wet and dripping falling into a curtain over the creature's face. Its body was a patchwork of fur and bare patches, pale flaking skin exposed to the faint moonlight. But the worst was hidden in shadow from its form. The chest, exposed and torn apart, a deep black organ as large as a man, pulsing weakly in the open air, a heart, large and rotten, dripping dark fluid into the earth. Adam stared at it, eyes wide and growing dry, yet unable to grow away. The Enchantress had appeared to him in many forms, young and beautiful, old and weak, hideous and downright disgusting. But for the first time in his life, he felt like he really was, truly, laying eyes on a monster. The kind that filled horror stories and the nightmares of battle-bred men. And it made Adam's old form seem like something fitting for a nursery rhyme. Circe's eyes opened. Enormous, bright, bleeding nearly as much as the putrid heart. But just as quickly, they closed once again. And she turned her terrible form away. Leave me in peace, she rasped, laying back on her forepaws. Adam bristled, though he wasn't sure why. He let go of Belle, pulling the blade sharply from his waist and wading into the pool of tears. It grew surprisingly deep, Cersei's dark blood swirling in the water about his waist. He reached the other side quickly, heart pounding, staring at her blackened heart as it throbbed against the earth. The sword was over his head now, held tight, already growing heavy in his hands. Giles had offered to take this burden from him, but that was no longer an option. Perhaps Adam had always known it had to end this way. He had been a fool to think another could do it for him. So he grit his teeth, raising the sword high and knowing what had to be done. What are you waiting for? He started, catching sight of those bleeding eyes that now watched him again. They narrowed. Shouldn't you have killed me by now, my pet? 
She rasped, short of breath. Adam wrinkled his nose, gripping the blade harder. Don't call me that, he said, refocusing on her black, throbbing heart. You're weak and powerless. You no longer control me. Oh, forgive me, she said scathingly. She coughed, rough and wet. Matt stared right back at him. Still, you didn't answer my question. Finally, he lowered the weapon, staring straight into her eyes. Stop! Stop playing with me! He gasped. I won't take it anymore! I'm not playing, she said breathless. She looked away. It was an honest inquiry. Adam stared at her weak, defeated form, but he felt nothing but disgust. Was this really the Enchantress? The one who had tormented him, mind and body, all these years? The one who left him orphaned, trapped in his own home, sobbing in agony as his childhood body betrayed him? Yet, even like this, she still made him feel weak still made him feel so small, still made him feel completely and utterly pathetic. And he hated it. Adam snarled, seething. For the first time, the Enchantress's existence no longer made him afraid. It only made him angry. And finally, he found his answer. He raised his sword again, pointing it towards her, and this time it no longer felt like a burden. You're right, he said, voice deep and cold. I should kill you. She shifted, turning back towards him so the heart was in full view, bulging and foul. So do it, she whispered. Adam? Fell's voice, perhaps, though it was distant. Boots splashed in the water behind him, but he barely heard it. Instead, he went on. You let this kingdom fall to a reign of terror, of poverty, of disease. You tormented my servants, my friends. He stopped, throat growing tight. Charlotte died, he gasped. Belle's mother died. Countless others, countless children, all dead. Their blood is on your hands. So do it, Cersei snapped. Adam! Bell called out, though he barely caught her words. She's weak. We can wait for the others. You, you don't have to do it like this. You took them from me. He growled, a shadow creeping into his heart. My mother, my father, you took them from me and left me alone all those years. He stepped closer, pressing the tip of the blade to her foul heart. I didn't have them for all those years. Adam, away, please. You're too close to this. You, you took that life from me. Forever, he gasped, shaking his head back and forth. I'll never get it back. Something was overtaking him. That old darkness. The one he had thought was gone forever. Reignited once again. Yet now, instead of a sadness, it had manifested as fury. You hurt me. He rasped. You hurt me. When I was only a child. When I did nothing. He had been so happy. Where had this pain come from? Would it never go away? At least. At least let me do it, Adam. Belle pleaded. Her voice had grown soft. Please. He didn't hear her. He couldn't. All he could see was the demon before him. All he could feel was an overwhelming, all-consuming wrath. I... I hate you, he whispered, fingers trembling against the hilt, shoulders shaking in rage. I hate you! So do it! So as he screamed, do it! I should! He shouted back, raising sword over his head once again before the blow. I will, you, you monster! The word came out as a roar. A roar like none he had ever voiced before. The growth all around them rustled at the sound. 
the ground rumbling beneath his feet. But then someone was there, arms around him, a soft warmth encasing him. Don't let it take you, Belle gasped, pressing herself against him, holding him close. You're not a monster, Adam. You're not. His body shook once, then twice. She hurt me. He gasped, feeling a new pain overwhelm him. I know. She hurt them. I know, Belle said softly. But I won't let her change you. Not again. Something shifted in the dark water. He looked down at his reflection. And a hideous beast stared back at him. He gasped, dropping the sword into the dark water and pulling his hands forward. Still human, he realised, trembling with relief. Still human. Agatha looked back at the water, at the shape he had lived in for ten years. Slowly, slowly, it vanished. The body of a man staring back at him once again. His arms fell to his sides. He felt numb unable to return Bell's embrace. Yet she only held him tighter. He squeezed his eyes shut, willing the moisture back inside as a terrible realisation flooded over him. Realisation that, even under Cersei's curse, he had never truly become a monster. But just now, he almost had. A whimper. Adam opened his eyes, and together, he and Belle turned towards the sound. The young girl had appeared again, standing just before them, watching Cersei's now writhing form as she screamed into the empty air. The child seemed more solid than before, her pale dress a bright piercing spot against the dark creature beyond. She was crying quietly. I didn't want to, she said, turning back towards them bringing an arm up to wipe her eyes. The cloudiness was gone, bright green orbs shining in the darkness. I didn't want to! Belle stared at her, eyes distant. It's when we finally see the humanity in our enemies that we find the true way to conquer them. She stopped, looking up at him. Agatha told me that. Adam blinked then looked back towards the crying child. The child that would grow into the Enchantress. Into the vile, hateful creature, bringing nothing but sorrow into this world. Cersei had chosen her fate. Had turned herself into this horrible monster by her own free will. Yet, at one point, she was human too. And maybe, maybe, a small part of her still was. Maybe that small part of her was standing right here. He crouched down, retrieving his sword from the shallow pool. Adam, Belle asked nervously. It's all right, he said. I understand now. He stared at the dripping sword, then looked back at the child once again and handed her the blade. She took the hilt in two small hands, staring at it wide eyed before looking back up at him. Adam nodded and stepped back. The young Cersei turned, staring at the writhing monster. She headed forward, dragging Adam's heavy sword behind her. The monster's heart beat slowly, painfully, the liquid inside having emptied, now replaced by a black mist seeping from its deep cracks. The girl stared at it as she approached eyes wide and unblinking. She swallowed, pulling the hilt close to her chest. The blade was nearly her height, the tip touching the ground where she stood. Her face grew pale and she looked back. Her eyes caught Belle's, then Adam's, and lingered there for a moment. Then she turned back, sucking in a deep breath and heaving the sword back. And finally, with all her might, she swung it towards the heart of darkness. The blade sliced through the flesh, releasing a wave of thick black smoke that flew out in all directions. Smoke 
and an ear-piercing scream that silenced every other sound in the forest. Adam reached for Belle, and they held each other tight as the storm-powered gust threatened to knock them into the earth. A flash of light, blinding, Adam shielded his eyes, unable to see what was happening until the strange light had dimmed again. The canopy of roses above had been blown away by the magic's strange force, and bright moonlight fell in a disc against the ground ahead. Both Circe's childhood form and the great creature that had once filled the space were gone. In their place was a woman on her hands and knees, middle-aged, hair long and blonde with streaks of grey. Adam stood slowly, helping Belle to her feet. She stared at Circe's new form, breathing shallowly. The only one who could destroy her darkness, she realised, was herself, he finished. Circe was staring at her reflection in the quiet water. She pressed her fingers to the skin beneath her eyes, then lowered them to her chest, to her heart. She warned me, she whispered. She warned me it would consume me, but I didn't listen. She looked up at them, and for the first time, eyes of soft green gazed out. They drifted over Adam's shoulder, as though looking towards some distant place, then fell back on him. Oh, God! She gasped, fingers reaching into her hair, dropping her face towards the earth, shaking her head in agony. What have I done? What have I done? Her reflection in the water shifted. I wish I could take it all back, she whispered, trembling. I wish I could change the past. Sifu says it's dangerous to look back. Cersei looked back at her reflection. The young girl was there again, rippling in the water. She shrugged and went on. Says you can't change the past. Only learn from it. Can't change the past? Cersei asked quietly. She reached for the child's form, brushing fingers over the water, barely touching the water's surface. Then, ever so slowly, she started to smile. Well, perhaps she was wrong. That old witch was never as talented as us. The girl's eyes grew wide, and after a moment of thought, her mouth curled into a smile to match. Cersei turned her eyes back on Adam. Green eyes. How strange that was. You were right, Prince Adam. I never did know what love was, she said solemn. Then she looked back, reaching for her reflection in the water, one hand over the surface, the other over her own heart. But I think if I do this, I will. And the world turned. The ground beneath their feet became open air, pulling them through the roses and the trees, until the forest was racing away from them far below. Adam! He searched for her voice and found Belle falling beside him, the wind whipping her clothes and hair with violence. She reached out with desperate fingers, and he just caught them in his own, the force of the air rushing past threatening to pull them apart at any moment. He met her eyes, wide and afraid, which glanced back towards the world below. He followed them, his pulse growing even faster than it already was. The entire surface of the earth seemed to shine like glass, reflecting the nighttime clouds and the stars above. A giant mirror for the heavens, it seemed. Adam! He looked back. Belle's body seemed faint in the darkness, and catching sight of his own hands. So did he. Her lips moved again, but no sound came through. Panic flashed through her face. Don't be afraid! He called her, fighting the fear in his own chest. Belle forced a nod, face growing more and more translucent by the moment. The wind grew stronger then, and deafening. I'll find you! Adam cried over the sound. I prom! His last word fell silent, and the wind tore them apart. And they vanished. Cersei landed hard. She gasped for breath once, twice then took in her surroundings. A beautiful bedchamber, the dark shadows of night. How far did it take me? She wondered. 
She looked towards the bed. The queen laid there, sleeping peacefully, the storm without only just beginning to blow against the shutters. Beside the bed stood a boy, Prince Adam's form, but when he turned, Circe knew it wasn't Adam at all. Fiery red eyes met hers, and Circe realised she was truly looking at herself in this stolen form. Herself from the past, preparing to lead Queen Jacqueline away and into those lethal woods. Not this time, Circe whispered, frowning. Those red eyes grew wide, confused, and ever so slowly, her old self grew translucent and vanished. Circe sighed, then looked towards the bed again. She still didn't care for the woman, but without the corrupting darkness inside, she had no desire to do her harm. Satisfied, she slowly left the bedchamber, shutting the door quietly behind her. Then, turning, Circe stumbled through the palace's dark halls. The storm was fierce when she emerged from the kitchens, but she had no strength to fight it. No magic left to escape through one of the mirrors that had lined the corridors, nor the icy path reflecting the castle's outer torches left behind. Instead, she paced through the snow, gasping for breath, feeling death slowly crawl through her veins and into her heart. The woods invited her into their depths, and she accepted their dark, empty embrace. Her knees hit the earth within their bounds, hands pressed against the fresh snow as she choked up blood. To think I'd die in such a way, she thought with dark amusement. Blood painted the snow beneath her fingertips. She coughed again. Dear child, what have you done? Cersei's head shot up. Sifu! She gasped. Agatha knelt beside her, wrapping a small ancient arm around her shoulders. What are you? Cersei couldn't finish, body shuddering violently from the cold and looming death. Agatha's hands was glowing running up her back as the old enchantress whispered strange spells. It's no use, Cersei managed. She stopped, sucking in a painful breath. I used my own life force this time. There's no healing. What is gone? Agatha frowned, but slowly pulled her hand away. There was no reason to, really, but Cersei went on. All those years, jumping ahead... It was easy, she said, breathless. It required little effort. And inaction. But to go back? To undo it all? I knew it would kill me. But this time? Agatha asked. Circe's strength had given out completely, and she found herself staring at the skies above as Agatha lowered her into her lap. I still knew, knew I'd die. She admitted. Then she huffed, grinning in spite of herself. But I decided I didn't care. Oh, dear girl, her old teacher said. You have finally learned to love. Is that what that was? Circe asked dryly. Of course, Agatha said. Sacrifice is one of the most beautiful forms of love. How nauseating. Agatha chuckled quietly. Cersei tried as well, but only managed to grimace. Love certainly hurts. Yes, it can. Maybe it's better this way. At least most of it was made right, she said. She frowned. It was, wasn't it? I do believe so, Agatha said. And perhaps your next reincarnation would be better. Ah, I forgot, Cersei sighed, closing her tired eyes. You're a Buddhist. I failed to convince you all those years, it seems. Agatha smiled. I don't know. It doesn't sound so bad now, Cersei said. It hurt to speak, and a strange light was forming against her eyes. I should like... Another chance. And soon, she could no longer feel anything at all. Cersei watched as the life left the woman's body. 
She held her close, feeling a strange sense of sorrow. She sighed some minutes later, wiping her eyes. Trapped me in a mirror all those years, and here I am shedding tears over you. You always were a complicated girl. That you were. She whispered, shaking her head. Next time, we'll both do better, eh? She laid the body on the snowy earth then, and raised her hands. Return to the earth, she declared. The body shimmered for a moment, then dissolved into a hundred shining particles that seeped into the ground and disappeared from sight. Yet, just as all grew dark again and Agatha had turned to leave, a new light emerged from the snowy bank. Something pushed its way into the air. A stem, bright green against the dark landscape, leaves unfolding slowly. And finally, dozens of soft red petals opened into a young flower. Ah, oh, there you are, child! Agatha exclaimed, reaching down to examine the rose. What a beautiful reincarnation! Another chance indeed! She stopped, smiling wide. Come! It's been some time since I was in my own land. Shall we go there first? The flower, of course, didn't make any indication it had heard her. Agatha wasn't perturbed, fully convinced she was speaking to her old student. Carefully, she dug the snow and earth around the young plant, removing it, roots and all. Agatha held the plant against her chest, like one would a small child, pulling a small hand mirror from her pocket that glowed in the shadows from early morning. We shall find you a lovely spot in my garden, Circe, she declared happily. The light of dawn started peeking over the hills beyond. Agatha grinned. Come, let's be off. Adam woke with a start. He grunted, rolling over and casting a hand across his face as a bright light filled his eyes. Soon it waned and he could see the soft rays of sun flitting in through his bedroom window. He looked around, a baby blue rug beneath him. A book pressed open against the carpet. Robinson Crusoe written in bright golden letters across its back. He reached for it, and a child's hand gripped its cover. He stopped and frowned, pulling the small hand back into his lap. He stared at it for a very long moment and blinked. I, I must have fallen asleep while reading last night. It had been a very good story after all. Good morning, my darling. Good morning, Mamma. Adam said as he approached the long dining table. Did you get any sleep? She asked. Huh? Didn't know the storm last night, eh? Papa said. He peeked his nose out from behind a large tome, propped open on the fine table. Was rattling the windows until half past three. I barely got a wink. I do hope no one was travelling through that last night. Mamma mused, frowning. I would not wish to be trapped out in such a storm. Papa, she... She's gone! Sweeping winds, snow coating his hair, wet eyes. Who's gone? Darkness, snow, sn the sounds of wolves, a heart filling with terror. Mama, she, she went out there. Adam, Adam, darling, what's wrong? He paused and the strange vision was gone. His parents were watching him now, faces painted with worry. Mama was already out of her chair, an arm around her shoulders. I... Adam stopped and shook his head to clear it. Never mind, it's nothing. There we are, love. A nice pot of peppermint tea should calm that headache in no time. Thank you, Mrs. Potts. The woman smiled warmly, then moved towards some other task in the large kitchen. Adam sat along the bench of an old oak table, legs swinging above the floor as he swirled a soft orange drink around a few times. Then he took a sip. Ouch! He cried. The drink had burned his tongue, and in his shock the cup slipped from his fingers. It hit the floor in a second, sending hot tea and a dozen pieces of porcelain scattering. And then the room went dark. Don't worry, love. No harm done, Mrs. Potts was saying, but her voice sounded far away. Happens all the time. Adam's hands had grown damp, and he found it hard to breathe. Charlotte! It was his own voice, but he hadn't remembered speaking the name. He felt dizzy, teetering where he sat. 
hands were on him, shaking him, calling his name. Charlotte, he said again. She's here, little master. Someone said, look, look up. Adam managed to open his eyes. My prince, are you well? A young woman stood there. With a thin build and long black hair, she had braided up against her head. She had been his closest caretaker as a young child, playing with him and reading him stories in the evening when Mamal couldn't do it himself. Adam stared at her, a strange and unexplainable relief flooding over him. You're alive, he gasped. His small fingers found her skirt, spearing his face against them and slowly finding his breath again. Of course I'm alive, Charlotte said soothingly, running a hand over the boy's head. Whatever made you think I wasn't? Adam closed his eyes, feeling exhausted, relieved, and more than anything, confused. I... I don't know. Have you lost something, my prince? Adam started at the voice, promptly wrapping his head on the bottom side of the large library desk. He crawled back out from the space, turning and rising to his knees. I... I believe I have, he mumbled, rubbing the bruise atop his head. Lumiere stood there, watching him curiously. Then he brightened. Well, might I help you look for, well, whatever it is you've lost? He inquired. That's the problem. I I can't remember what, Adam admitted. He furrowed his brows, looking back over the large room. Shelves of books disappearing into the ceiling. But I think I'll know it when I find it. I suppose that's logical, Lumiere agreed. Well, should, heaven forbid, this missing article be one of those thousands of tomes? Perhaps you should start with the index. Adam glanced over at the large stacks of parchment that sat atop the desk behind him. I can't believe it. I've never seen so many books in all my life. I I don't even know where to start. Huh. It's an index. Still incomplete, but it may help. The indices. Even the desk itself had grown blurry as Adam's vision swam. Instead, he saw a face, beautiful and kind, familiar. She smiled, and then it was gone. My prince? Lumia asked, frowning. Whatever is the matter? Adam ignored him, heart starting to race. I didn't lose something, he realised quietly. I lost someone. Belle waited patiently, the scratches of chalk against her little board the only sound filling their cottage home. Maman sat with the board in her, in her lap, writing out several short equations before finally handing the tours back to her. There, she told Belle, that will be your morning exercise. Belle took the board and the small stick of chalk, yet she couldn't tear her eyes away from Maman's face. For some reason, she felt so wonderfully incredibly happy. Belle? Maman asked, cocking her head. Is something wrong? Belle blinked and shook her head slowly. No. Well then, get started on that addition, Maman told her. I made those last three extra challenging today. All right, Belle said, trying to shake the strange urge to burst into tears of relief. So, sucking in her breath, she got to work. Not a minute later, she looked up. I'm finished. Maman had was just putting on her work boots before heading outside to feed the chickens. She turned, smirking. Don't tease me. Come now, you have to do them all. I did, Belle insisted, sliding out of her chair and bringing the little board over for her mother to see. Mamma took it from her, raising a brow and looked over her work. Her expression soon grew into one of confusion. Belle, you... She stopped, furrowing her brows looking over the work again, then back to Belle. Dear, did Papa practice these with you the other day? No, Belle replied. She bit her lip. Are they wrong? No, no, they're perfect, Mamma hummed, sliding back out of her boots and settling down at the table once again. Here, let's try some larger numbers. Now, when you have two digits, you must start with those furthest right, and Mamma, you already taught me that. Maman blinked and looked up again. I did? Belle nodded. Maman looked away, scratching her head. Then she turned, grabbing the old rag from the table and wiping the equations away. Taking a long minute, 
she then wrote a subtraction of two four-digit numbers. Before she even set the chalk down, spoke 398. Maman froze and looked up at her in shock. Then, slowly, she raised the numbers and started again. This problem spanned the length of the board, and that included a half dozen operations. Belle took a moment longer than first, but still managed to complete the equation in her head. Negative twelve and a half. This time Maman had to check it herself. That's right, she said quietly. She seemed strangely nervous, looking at Belle like she was some alien being. Um, why don't you take the day to read then, my dear, she said. Then she stood, raising a hand to her head, mumbling to herself as she went back to lace up her boots and head outside. Belle, however, didn't realise anything was wrong. Instead, she happily ran to their small bookshelf, selected two novels, and spent the morning reading beneath an oak tree. Some hours later, she was staring up into its branches. She sighed to herself, savouring the end of the first tale. Did you really climb to the top of the tallest tree here? Why? Did you want to see it? Belle sat up in an instant, looking around for the sources of the voices. Hello? She called out. No one replied. So, with a childish innocence, she shrugged. Distracted now, she set her book aside and slid open the new sketch bag Papa had given her last Christmas. It was filled with simple drawings of farm animals and flowers and their small family. Far from realistic, but still quite good for one so young. Yet Belle just wrinkled her nose at them. She could do better than that, couldn't she? She found a fresh page and started a sketch with Ernest. She had nothing particular in mind, but soon a form had taken to the page. Well, you've gotten quite good. She looked up. Papa was standing beneath the tree beside her, staring down at her drawing in awe. Soon, however, he furrowed his brows. That one's a bit frightening, though, I will admit. Belle stared down at her work. A beast looked back from the page, with horns and fangs and a fur-coated face. I know he looks vicious, but she smiled, touching his cheek with her fingertips. He's my friend. Your friend? Papa chuckled, though not unkindly. What a wonderful imagination you have, my dear. He declared. He planted a kiss atop her head, then headed backwards towards the wide open fields to finish her day's work. Belle didn't know why she had drawn her friendly beast, but she found herself looking at the drawing with fondness throughout the day. It was her best yet, she supposed. That must be the reason. That night, she lay in bed, a small knob of chalk in one hand as she sketched out against the slanted ceiling of her attic room. She let her fingers draw at will. A small teacup blowing bubbles from its top, a candelabra with a waxy smile, a sword with a hand-carved handle she could only imagine to be flaked with gold, a suit of armour dipping into a curtsy. She smiled at them. Footsteps up the attic ladder. Lights up now, Belle. Papa said, poking his head out from below. He blew out the candle along the floor. Sweet dreams, my Belle. Good night, Papa. She waited until he was gone, then reached behind her, finding the cord in the darkness. She tugged it with both small arms until the ceiling parted above her. Pulling the blankets to her chin, she watched the new stars light the sky above. The winter snows had only just melted, but she didn't feel cold. In fact, she felt incredibly warm, as though someone familiar was beside her. She smiled again, eyes lingering on the stars for another moment, before letting her lids fall closed. Good night, Adam. Your mother is starting to worry about you. I'm fine, Papa, said Adam uncomfortably. The king frowned, unconvinced. Really? Alexander watched him another moment longer, then hummed. It's only... It seems the moment your mother grows better, you suddenly begin acting different yourself, he admitted. But perhaps I'm being paranoid. I do tend to worry about you both like that. Adam swallowed. He had admittedly been hearing things, seeing things that didn't make sense. Though it was more like he was remembering things, really. A constant sense of deja vu. Everywhere he went in the castle, or along the grounds, he heard a voice, saw a face he didn't know, but somehow knew. Every time he thought he grasped it, it would slip away. 
slip away and leave him feeling utterly, miserably alone. He glanced out of the window, water dripping from the gutter, pale green grass beginning to show as the winter snows finally melted. I think I'm going to hike to the peak today, he said to himself, before turning back to Papa. Is that all right? Ah, yes, some fresh air should do you good, the king said. Shall I join you? Adam pursed his lips. I... I think I need to be alone. Won't give me an excuse to escape Cogsworth, eh? Papa said, sighing and leaning back in his deep desk chair. Well, I suppose even a ten-year-old man must take time to contemplate in solitude, he smiled. Adam didn't catch his joke, still staring through the window at the hills beyond. Papa hummed again, frowning. Well, be back for your afternoon studies with the professor, then. Adam blinked and looked back. Yes, Papa. He sat along the rocky ledge, legs hanging into the wide open air, a still frozen lake far below, and a thousand trees spanning the valley bowl. The snow along the trail had mostly melted, though still covered much of the scene before him. A charcoal sketch, black, black stained fingertips, moving quickly over the page. Well, how is it? A fair depiction? Her voice again, even all the way up here. Adam tried to hold on to it, using every ounce of focus his small body contained, but the strange memory slipped away once more. He groaned in frustration, ducking his head and burying his fingers into his hair, freeing several strands from their ribbon. Sending the loose hairs away from his eyes with a huff, the young prince fell to his back and stared at the clouds high above. He could see a faint crescent of the moon, a few of the brightest stars in the early morning sky. Even these seemed to remind him of something. Remind him of her. Who are you? He whispered desperately. Where are you? And then, finally, something answered. A tug on his chest, sharp and urgent. Adam sat up, scrambling away from the cliffside before pulling himself over. Then he watched, wide eyes and breathless, as a bright line shot from his chest and towards the distant hills, toward the villages beyond, towards... He gasped, reaching for the place where the shining string tugged on his heart. Bell! Ah, good morning, Prince Adam. Would you like to take Olive out for... The stable hands topped short as Adam ran past him into Olive's stall. He hopped up, grabbing her saddle and throwing it over her side. Well... He tried to, anyway, but his legs were much shorter than he remembered. Your Highness, please allow me to. Adam had already yanked the closest crate over, climbing atop and throwing the saddle on successfully this time, before fastening the straps in haste. The stable man watched with his mouth hanging open, unable to function in his shock. My, my prince, he finally managed. Who taught you to? Thank you, Adam said quickly, jump, jumping from the crate and onto Olive's saddled back. He grabbed the reins, gave her a kick, and the pss was flying out of the barn door before the poor man could even get a full sentence out. He had to slow at the front gates, which hadn't yet been opened for the day. His father was out there, speaking with Giles and one of the older guards. He turned, catching sight of Adam, and cocking his head. Bark already? he said curiously. And where are you off to now? Molyneux, Adam said quickly. Molyneux? The king cried, Good grief, son, Abel's Peak is one thing, but a two-hour ride on your own, your mother would have my neck. Damn, Adam thought, wildly, realising his mistake. I forgot I'm just a kid. Please, Papa, he said in haste, it's important. Important? What's so important? Adam racked his brain for some excuse. Bell's there, he wanted to say, but of course that wouldn't make any kind of sense to Papa. The... The school, he said at last. They aren't letting the girls go to school in Molyneux. Alexander furrowed his brows. Where did you hear this? Um, in the kitchens, Adam, fu Adam fibbed. One of the footmen said it. Damn. Papa said, frowning deeply. Well, I'll speak with Cogsworth. We can send a representative out too. We have to go now, Adam insisted. P please, Papa, I, I want to start helping this kingdom too. He grit his teeth 
hoping desperately that it would work. Papa seemed to reconsider that. Then he smiled. Ah, ready to get involved already? Yes, yes, perhaps that it would be a good experience for you. He turned to the guard. At his side, tell old cock that I'll be missing my meetings this morning, he said happily. Oh, and Adam, go bring Olive back. We're taking the carriage. Adam hadn't wanted to travel by carriage. It was far slower than horseback, after all. But he'd barely... But given he'd barely gotten his way in the first place, he figured he ought to concede. Still, the ride had been torturous. He stared out of the window impatiently the entire time, tapping his fingers relentlessly against the glass, certain he could have run to Molyneux faster than this. Across from him, Papa simply hummed happily to himself at the spontaneous excursion. Adam huffed a stray hair from his eyes, looking back out of the window. They had finally reached the empty, snow-patched fields of Molyneux's outer border in the last quarter of an hour, and now, squinting, he could just make out the little town in the distance. His heart leapt at the sight of it, and once again that bright silver string flowed from his chest, ducking beneath the carriage door and down the length of the dark road ahead of them. Adam looked back, but Papa didn't seem to see it. He looked back out of the window, scouring the countryside. And, only a few minutes later, he saw it. A small cottage with a water wheel spinning in the morning sun. Stone steps carefully placed in the hill atop which it sat. Bell's house. Adam flung the carriage door open, toppling out onto the dirt road as the carriage continued rumbling on. Adam! His father shouted from behind. Adam didn't pay him any mind, bracing up the short hill and leaping onto the porch in one bound. He paused on the threshold, heart hammering, trying to catch his breath. His hand was raised to knock, but he paused. Will Bell remember me? How long had it taken him to remember? At least a few days. But it could have been years for all he knew. And suddenly he was terrified she might not recognise him at all. Heavy footfalls up the steps behind him. Adam! His father rasped, resting his hands on his knees when he stood, catching his breath. By God, what has gotten into you? And the door opened. Someone here? Maurice asked. He blinked, staring at the king and the prince, his eyes growing wide. Someone cleared their throat. Giles had accompanied them and now stood nearby. His Majesty, King Alexander and Prince Adam, he announced formally, though a faint grin on his face. Maurice stared at them both. Mouth agape. You, you're... He couldn't finish, pulling off his hat and falling to one knee. Ah, oh, apologies, the king said awkwardly. Please rise, good sir. This is just some kind of misunderstanding. It seems my son... Adams had stopped listening, searching the room behind Maurice for the one he had come for. It was full of warmth and life, like it hadn't been when he had come with Belle that summer's evening. A table with a spread of breakfast, the smell of porridge and eggs, simple yet cosy furniture with books scattered along their cushions and the floor. A fire burning in the hearth, and a woman sitting on a rocker beside it. A girl sat in her lap, her arms reaching around the woman's neck, and head resting against her shoulder. Her knees were tucked into her lap, eyes closed and expression peaceful. But then, as though sensing his presence, she opened his eyes and looked over at him. And she smiled. Belle climbed out of her mother's lap and said something Adam couldn't hear. Soleil kissed her head and turned to check the pot over the fire, while Belle crossed the room and pulled on her boots. She then approached their visitors, stopping just before the young prince. She reached for Adam's hand, their fingers entwined, and they held back tight, heart bursting with relief. Belle looked up at their fathers then, who were now staring at them in dumbfounded silence. Then she glanced back at Adam with a knowing look in her eye. Want to see Max? He's just a puppy, she offered. Adam smiled wide and nodded excitedly. With that, the two children ran outside and out of sight. The men on the porch watched them go, perplexed. Then, shrugging, the king looked back at Maurice. Monsieur, I have to ask, have we met before? Your Majesty? Ah, oh, I don't know what I'm saying. You just, you seem very... He trailed off, catching sight of something inside the house. Sir, forgive me, but what on earth is this contraption you have here? Oh, uh, j just an old invention of mine, my king, Maurice said, looking embarrassed. Let's you see who's on the other side of the door. We've got some, um, nosy neighbours, you could say. 
Incredible, the king stared a hand to his chin. May I? Oh, of, of course, your majesty. Alexander moved inside. Giles, you stand there. I'm going to have a go at this. As you wish, my lord. He shut the door. Voice muffled from the other side. Brilliant! I can see you like you were just before me. The door opened again, and Alexander stepped back out onto the porch, grinning to himself. Do you think these could be stored inside doors too? He asked, looking back at Maurice. Why, certainly, Maurice declared, beaming. Would you mind knowing when Cogsworth was coming to drag me off to some meeting or another? The king looked back at Maurice. Monsieur Dupont, he answered. Maurice Dupont. Monsieur Dupont, haven't you heard of the programme, have you? The programme, your highness? Yes, the programme for... He trailed off, face contorting for a long moment before raising a finger in the air. The programme for funding the common inventor, otherwise known as the PFCI. It's quite important. Behind the house, two children stood beneath Philippe's stall, chicken feet scattered beneath their feet, holding on to each other close. You remember? Adam asked finally. Belle laughed, hugging him tight. Isn't it obvious? I mean, when did you remember? She finally pulled back. Just this morning. The string was glowing when I woke up. She flushed a little. It's been tugging all morning, so I knew you were on your way. She smiled. He smiled, but quickly furrowed his brows. But how could the cord still exist between us? I mean, all of that, it never happened now, right? Didn't it? asked Belle. We remember, don't we? Adam scratched his head. I guess. Besides, Agatha said no spell could break the bond between us. Belle went on. Not even a jump back in time, it seems. I suppose. But my brain still hurts just thinking about it. Belle hadn't seemed to hear that. Now looking him up and down, the corner of her mouth began to twitch. What? Oh, Adam asked, looking down at his clothes. They were a bit covered in mud from his jump out of the carriage, but nothing ridiculous. I'm, I'm sorry, she giggled, raising a hand to cover her smile. You're just, you're so little. Oh, that. He grinned a bit. And you're just as adorable as I thought you would be. He paused, smirking. Even with those missing teeth. Hey! <laughs> Belle laughed. They're still growing in. He chuckled himself now. I can't believe this, he gasped. We really are little. A high-pitched bark. Adam looked over at a small grey mutt running across the yard. Max! He cried. The, puck, the puppy pucked up his ears, turning and racing towards them. Adam scooped up the dog as he approached, holding him at arm's length. You're little too, he cried. Max yapped again, panting happily. They laughed for a long minute and soon found themselves sliding down the side of the fence as they gripped their stomachs, as they began to ache from all the effort. It shouldn't have been this amusing. It really shouldn't have. But even the simplest things felt funnier now than they used to. Did children always laugh this much? We will need to be a bit careful, Belle said once they managed to calm down. How so? Adam asked, scratching Max behind the ears. It's just, well, I think I nearly gave Mamma a heart attack when I recited Shakespeare in perfect English this morning. And suddenly he sobered, setting Max down again and looking up. Your mother! He breathed. She nodded, smiling, her eyes a bit wetter than they had been before. And so he hugged her again. She'll be okay this time, he promised. All of it. All of it would be worth it, just for that. I know some things can't be changed, Belle replied. But I think maybe you're right. I am, he said, and they laughed again. I almost wish the others could remember too, he admitted after a long moment, pulling back. But maybe it's better if they don't. They might remember later, Belle shrugged. We'll just have to wait and see. They were quiet for another moment, still soaking it all in. Then Adam sighed. What is it? Belle asked. Well, I just realised, now that we're kids again. He looked up in the straw roof above, feeling his face beginning to burn. Then he glanced over with a lopsided smile in spite of himself. I probably can't ask you to marry me yet, huh? Belle blinked, and in an instant her own cheeks grew pink. She looked away, tucking that loose strand of hair behind her ear. I don't think Papa would be very happy with that right now.
she replied, smiling. Actually, he did give me his blessing already. Technically. Belle's mouth fell open and she looked back at him. He did? Adam looked down at the small hands that were once resting on his own. He wore a thin golden band on his right index finger, some kind of symbol of his status. He had forgotten all about it until now. He tugged it off, looking at it for a moment, suddenly nervous. Then he turned, holding it out to her. A promise? He asked quietly. He swallowed. That? That I'll ask again? Later? Belle looked at the ring for a long moment. Then back at him. Her eyes softened. I promise, she whispered. He helped her slip it on, where it fit a bit loosely on her own finger. Then he leaned in, kissing her softly on the cheek before pulling away. You know what's strange? he asked. Hmm? she asked, still looking at the small promise ring and smiling to herself. I don't know what it is, but I kind of just want to go play, he admitted, grinning a bit. Belle giggled softly, a hand to her mouth. Me, me too. Suddenly, a mischievous look crossed her face. She stood quickly, grinning. Race you to the old oak. The old... Hey! Adam cried out, for Belle was already sprinting out of the makeshift barn. He scrambled to his feet, taking off after her, laughing wildly as they ran over the nearby hills. Neither yet realised that their instincts had returned to those of children. But they didn't have to. All they needed to do was live the new life they had been given, together. And live it, they did. End of chapter. Hi guys, hope you enjoyed this one. Okay, so this is the last chapter, but there's an epilogue coming up, and I will be splitting that into parts too, because these are really long. And can I just say, oh my flipping god, that got gory at the beginning, but ended so flippin' heartwarmingly. I love that, so now they can grow up together. And can I just say, Alexander showing interest in Maurice's inventions and him coming up with another program like he did for Jacqueline. Okay, does he just make up programs to keep those he likes near him? Because, I mean, if you're a king, that's going to work, but still shouldn't, shouldn't use that in a bad way. But luckily, he's the good sort. And, oh, little Belle and Adam are so flipping cute. I mean, they're playing with a puppy and he gives her that little ring. Oh, my heart. Anyway, I'll see you in the epilogue, guys. Bye. And remember to like, comment, and subscribe. You know the drill, my guys, guys, on non-binary pals. Have a good day, night, or wherever time zone you're in. Take care.